Okay, thank you very much. I will talk about um, FACONS and uh, some applications of that. Um, in particular, how to build uh, consistent theories of massive higher spin multiplets and uh, use them to formulate a Palatini version of quantum gravity. So let's begin with this idea of FACONS, or fake particles, or purely virtual particles. What are they? They are uh, non-particles in some sense, because they have no classical limit. Normally, we think of something quantum as obtained by the quantization of something classical. Uh, but uh, what if there is something that cannot be quantized because there is no classical counterpart of it? So that, uh, that is something that is purely quantum and that can only be formulated <coughs> working at a quantum level, inside loops, so to speak. And then if you want, you may discuss its classical limit, the remnants of it in the classical limit by classicizing the quantum theory. So this is um, more or less some wave function that doesn't like to be collapsed at all, that uh, evades any of our instruments because as soon as uh, it finds a, an instrument, a detector made of many, many atoms, inside it is automatically zero. So that's the idea, how to formulate something like that. And uh, if you think a moment, you cannot exclude it because uh, it's possible to have something that doesn't reach the classical limit. So the trick, the best way to formulate is, it is by means of a new diagrammatics. We will review that. And um, among the various applications, maybe the most important one is that you can formulate a consistent theory of quantum gravity by consistent, I mean, renormalizable and unitary at the same time. And it is unitary thanks to these things. Um, it's also testable because if you apply that uh, theory to uh, primordial cosmology, you get a sharp prediction for the tensor to scalar ratio in inflationary cosmology, which is the prediction you see here. And uh, this number hopefully will be measured soon. So let's see if it falls precisely in that window. We will not have time to review this part here. There are many phenomenological applications. It can be used to search for new physics beyond the standard model because you can evade various constraints that um, limit the applicability of physical particles. And you can also propose methods to solve discrepancies with data. And the diagrammatics we will see is very simple. It's very simple to calculate a bubble, the triangle, the box, and uh, it can be implemented in software. So it's not something difficult to, to understand in the end. Uh, other possibilities, the one we will focus in this talk is the construction of consistent theories of high spin massive multiplets. Multiplets because you cannot make uh, a single uh, higher spin massive field renormalizable and unitary by itself, like a spin 2, you need something else. In this case, it will be a spin 0 and a spin 1. And some of those uh, extra fields belonging to the multiplet will be fake, will be quantized in this new way and with this diagrammatics that's special of fake particles. Not only, but if you add these fields to gravity, you can change the behavior of the renormalization group flow of gravity at high energies. Uh, because normally it is not asymptotically free, but you can make it asymptotically free. And this was shown recently by Marco Piva. Other applications are mm, to cosmology, but those are not going to be discussed here. So let me skip this slide. So let me begin by introducing FACONS, and the crucial notion is unitarity. And um, unitarity is the statement that the S matrix, S, is uh, the scattering matrix, is unitary. And if you write S as 1 plus IT, then you can express it by means of the optical theorem, which is this identity here. And if you use states of some space of physical states, you can have 
the usual identity that tells you that the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude is the cross-section for the production of all the intermediate states. And here inside you have a completeness relation, so unity, because this, you see, is a product of two matrices. And the crucial thing is that this equation is not a linear equation, it is quadratic. And since it is quadratic, you have a contraction in the middle, and the contraction is this completeness relation, which will be crucial for what we will say, because you cannot decide what appears here. You can decide what you put in the external states, of course. That's your choice. But what appears inside, you cannot change. And if some ghosts or wrong things appear in the middle, then your theory is not good. Um, if some ghosts appear, by the way, you will have some minus ones here, uh, and that will not be acceptable. Instead of having a positive sum, you will have some minus signs, and that cannot be a cross-section, of course. Well, the good thing, the uh, very good thing of this uh, identity is that it can be lifted to, a, let's say, more powerful identity, which is a diagrammatic identity, which you can study with Feynman diagrams by extending them to the so-called cut diagrams. And what is, uh, why is it a generalization with respect to that? Because it holds off-shell. This is not constrained to be on-shell. And so you can study it as you study normally diagrams. Of course, if you prove an, a diagrammatic identity like this, where G is the diagram, G bar is the complex conjugate diagram, and these are cut diagrams. They are made of two pieces, and you cut one part out, and that is T, and the other part will be T dagger. Well, if you prove this identity, which is some, somewhat redundant because it's off-shell, yet it is, of course, enough to prove the optical theorem, it would be enough to prove just the optical theorem on-shell, but nobody knows how to do that. So it's better to aim at something redundant, and then that will imply the on-shell statement that you want. Here <clears throat> you can see two examples of such identities, which are just to illustrate what they are. For example, in the first case, you have this diagram, which is just a propagator, basically. This is just the propagator. So it's to have an identity on the propagator, and uh, you can cut it, and then you this cut means that you have the integral on the phase space of final states of this kind of vertex. And so uh, the conclusion of this identity is that the real part of the propagator, the imaginary part of minus i the propagator, the real part is not negative, because the right-hand side is not negative. <clears throat> the other identity here is to show you, in the case of the bubble, that this is a quadratic identity, so it mixes loop orders. For example, here is one loop, and here is three level. So, because of this, you cannot, um, you, you are constrained to be careful if you want to do what we will talk about in a moment. Let's see if it is. Recording in progress, 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 okay, progress, 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 okay. Physical particles and uh, ordinary ghosts and living ghosts and purely virtual particles are the main ways to quantize a particle. And uh, this is uh, uh, a list of them. And they are propagators. They are three-level propagators. So this is just a brief overview to see the differences. So a physical particle is this. And if you decompose it into the principal value and the delta function, you will see that the real part, the delta part, the on-shell part, is indeed non-negative in agreement with the unitarity statement we said a moment ago. But you can also have ordinary ghosts, and this, uh, these appear, for, for example, in higher derivative theories. What are they? They are the same thing with a minus sign in front. And of course, if you have a minus sign in front, that's where you violate unitarity. But you have, can have other choices. For example, you can change this sign also, and then there is a way, possibly, uh, to make sense of them uh, by Lee and Vic. We'll comment briefly in a moment, because this has a real part that is okay. 
And finally, the other possibility is to have no real part at all. And this is the fake particle. So the idea here is to have nothing. It will work for both signs in front. We will use one sign only. But let me also stress something very, very important. And these two things are particular with respect to the others. Why? Because you cannot use these propagators inside Feynman diagrams as they look like, as they appear right in front of your eyes now. You can use those inside Feynman oh, diagrams. Excuse me, excuse me, let me ask you yes. about the last uh, type of particles. Yes. In the uh, three first uh, cases, you can derive uh, these uh, propagators from some Lagrangian. Can you derive, is there exist some Lagrangian leading to fake ions particles? You, you mean you, these you can derive from? So, yes, some, this one. We can imagine the Lagrangian for this case, for this case. Uh, yes, no. You but can. here? You, the, you, you cannot derive the prescription from the Lagrangian, no, because the Lagrangian is classical. So this is something you cannot uh, find from the classical limit. You can okay. Okay. do what I will tell you in a moment, and then you can study the classical limit from okay. that. Okay, thank you. And so, Damien, I suppose that the uh, the parenthesis there at the denominator was supposed to be squared, right? Squared, yes. Thank you. Okay, right. Uh, sorry, do I understand correctly that all these are Green's functions for yes. classical equations of motion? They just have different boundary conditions. Yes, the, 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 in the, they can be seen as different boundary conditions, but in the case of fake particles, the, you have to see them as such. There is no boundary condition you can add here because there is no particle. So that is like a green function that mediates interactions. So it's effectively, it is like a non-local interaction among the other particles. You cannot revive the particle here in the classical limit. So we will comment on that later. Okay, that's the crucial thing. Here you will have this thing plus its uh, boundary conditions, which will, of course, reconstruct the full classical theory. Here you will have the same. Here you will have the same. But in this case, you will not because the classical limit will also be different from what you expect. Okay, we will say uh, this mm -hmm. more precisely. Thank you. But the, uh, for the moment, let me comment on the diagrammatics because we have to start from diagrams. And these two last things are particular because they mix the plus i epsilon with the minus i epsilon. Here there is the two. And uh, you cannot have uh, both prescription, plus i epsilon and minus i epsilon inside Feynman diagrams because you can check this paper with the calculations, then you violate all sorts of uh, good properties like the locality, uh, hermeticity of counter terms, you exchange thresholds and pseudo thresholds. What, what is the reason? The reason is that uh, you can, uh, the, the poles of these propagators with this prescription are misplaced. And if you integrate on real energies and real space momenta, you have something bad. But you can quantize these uh, entities in a different way. And one way is to provide a new contour prescription for the integral, and this is the Levick proposal for the Levick ghosts, or an entirely new diagrammatics for phacons. I will not review this part here. I will publish a paper in, a, in some days on that. I will concentrate on this and then the application to high spin multiplets. So let's go back to the unitary equation. Uh, when you have something bad in your theory, like a ghost, you would like to get rid of it. Okay, and uh, how to get rid of it? You can, of course, ignore ghosts in in and out states. For example, you do not put Fadeyev Popov ghosts in in and out states. Well, you cannot decide what happens here inside, because what happens is the completeness relation, whatever it is, and if that completeness relation requires contributions with minus signs, because of the propagators we saw previously, the ghost propagators, which have the wrong sign there, this wrong sign will be a minus sign in the other place. Here, there will be a minus sign. Then uh, you violate the unitarity. So let me call projection an operation 
a removal of states from the physical space that is consistent everywhere in the identity. So if you remove those states here, in and out, they end also there, in the middle, then the identity holds, and it will hold after the removal in this form, with no minus signs. What is an example of a, a good projection? The one of gauge theories, of course. You do not put Fadev Popov ghosts and longitudinal and temporal components of the gauge fields, not in and out, and not even inside. That's ensured by the symmetry, and that is what ensures the consistency of the projection. <clears throat> Another case where you can have a consistent projection is uh, in the case of the Levick ghosts, where, however, you are projecting away the Levick ghost just because you assume that they are unstable in the sense that they have a width so they decay, and you just consider very strictly asymptotic states. Uh, that is uh, the way Levick models work. So, I, although I cannot comment in detail on them, but I think they are good effective theories, but they cannot be fundamental ones because you, it means that you are discarding the muon, basically. The muon is an unstable particle because it decays, and in this approach it will not be considered an observable particle while instead we observe it. And the other possibility is to ensure the consistency of this projection by means of a new diagrammatics. Let me go to that because in the end it is simpler than it may sound. So, let's start from the tree level. You may I ask a question? Yes. Um, uh, there is a the problem with leak, a weak prescription is uh, vacuum stability. So the vacuum may decay faster than the universe time. So that instability is a problem. Uh, yes. What happens in this case? Vacuum instability. Um, that is something I cannot tell you about now. Probably you will have some hints when I will talk about better how they work. Okay. So the, the thing about the diagrammatics is the following one. You start from the Feynman prescription, okay? So you start from something you know everything about, a diagram defined by the usual Feynman I epsilon prescription. We can put plus or minus in front, but this will be an overall plus or minus in all the identities. So the identities will still be true. And you decompose it with the principal value and the on-shell part. And then you drop the on-shell part. That's how you eliminate the uh, non-purely virtual part. And this is the propagator you get at the tree level. That's it. That's the, that's the end. You do not use, however, this propagator inside diagrams. Inside diagrams, you do some, something similar. Inside diagrams, you ignore the integral. So you do the following thing. You, Define the diagram by means of the I epsilon Feynman prescription. Then, well, one simplified procedure is to ignore completely the integral on the loop space momenta components, the space components of the loop momenta, just integrate on the energies by means of the residue theorem. That is a, an algebraic operation. After you do, you have integrated on the loop energies you use this decomposition after that. And then you drop all the deltas that contain phacon frequencies, frequencies of the particle that you want to quantize this way. You drop them. Let me show you in the bubble and in the triangle. <clears throat> well, in one loop diagrams, a generic diagram is a product of propagators. Then you can have derivative vertices. They will not change much. so. Let's just assume that the vertices are 1. And let me factor out, factor out the integral on the space components of the loop momentum and some factor here for convenience. Then you have just an integral on the loop energies. Okay, some integral. And then you do this integral by means of the residue theorem. So in the case of the bubble, for example, you have two propagators. So this is the integral, two propagators. 
once you integrate, you lose one denominator, so you have just the sum of various terms, four terms, two cancel out, and you remain with just these two terms. So this is to be integrated on the loop components, the space components of the loop momentum, which we do not do because we can prove the optical theorem without doing that. And then you decompose the two objects here in terms of principal values and deltas. And that's it, that's the normal bubble. You want a fake, one of the two uh, legs to be a fake, then omega one, the frequency will be fake. It is inside both deltas, so you drop both deltas, and this is the bubble with fake particles inside. So, um, for example, here I am considering the bubble with, together with the, uh, the conjugate diagram and the two cut diagrams that are necessary to prove the, it's called cutting equation, which is um, the equation that is necessary to prove the optical theorem. I didn't mention it. This is called cutting equations. They say the route to prove the optical theorem. And for the other diagrams, you do the same operations, exactly the same operations. So you do not integrate on the loop space momentum. You um, integrate on the loop energies by means of the residue theorem, and then you use this composition. In cut diagrams, it's much simpler because the cut propagators are deltas already by themselves, so you only have deltas. So you get this table. Let me describe this table. In vertical, you have the diagrams. What does that mean? For example, this is the bubble. The bubble will be some principal value, minus one some delta function, Define here, minus one sum times the other delta function. This is how you read it. The conjugate uh, diagram is the conjugate diagram, so this principal value is conjugate and the delta contributions are the same. And then you calculate the two cut diagrams and they only have deltas. And you see that the rows vanish. So this is the optical theorem. The optical theorem is that these rows vanish, but they vanish independently. You do not need to sum all of them. So instead of the optical theorem, by doing this, you get a much more powerful set of identities, which are the rows, which I call spectral optical identities. Spectral because I do not integrate on the loop space momentum, the space components of the loop momentum. They are hold without that and purely algebraically. And this way you can dissect the optical theorem. We are still in the Feynman prescription. We are still with normal particles, with normal diagrams. You can dissect it into a much more powerful, uh, purely algebraic set of statements. And so when you want to uh, make uh, the internal leg fake, you eliminate two rows where you have the frequency inside the delta. The deltas where the frequency of the fake one is inside. You eliminate them. And if you eliminate the rows, the optical theorem is necessarily preserved because they vanish independently. So you eliminate the rows everywhere and still the optical theorem will be true. And so this fake on prescription will um, necessarily be consistent with the optical theorem. But you notice another thing, that once you eliminate these two rows, two columns disappear as well because they have only zeros. And you eliminate also those. So those two disappear. And what is the meaning of that? Well, they disappear because necessarily you are cutting a fake particle. One of the two internal legs necessarily is fake now. And the fake particle, once it's cut, by definition, it should be on shell. But there is no fake particle on shell by definition of fake. So that's why you directly remove those two columns. Basically, it's like saying that the cut propagator of a fake particle, instead of being delta of p squared minus m squared, it's just zero. And that's why this works. So let me give you an example of the difference between uh, physical particles and fake particles in uh, 
the bubble, if you calculate a bubble diagram in four dimensions with no masses, massless fields, for example, you have a logarithm with the Feynman prescription. What's the difference with the fake? You have this function here. Well, uh, you see that the, the logarithm is an analytic function. It has a branch cut. But this logarithm is two analytic functions, one below the threshold and one above the threshold. And uh, in three dimensions, it's striking. Uh, the difference is striking because in three dimensions, you have uh, a square root. And once you do the prescription, uh, above the threshold, which here is p squared equals zero, you have zero because a square root averages to zero. So how do you see this function in the complex plane? Well, instead of having a, a branch cut, normally a, a logarithm has a branch cut in the negative real axis and your amplitude is the thing you obtain by approaching the branch cut from above or from below. One is the amplitude and the other one is the complex conjugate diagram. Here, instead, the amplitude is something different. And so it's like enlarging the negative real axis into a cone, wherever you want to put it, because it's not important. And so above the real axis, in the positive real axis, which is below the threshold, you have the usual value, same as Feynman diagram, but below the threshold, you have a different value. And the two functions cannot be analytically connected. They cannot. Because you have the complex plane that is cut in two this time by the cone. Instead of having just a branch cut, you have two disjoint regions. Let me uh, show you the triangle. You do the same thing with the triangle. You have three propagators. And uh, after integrating on the loop energies by means of the residue theorem, you will have only principal values, uh, only the products of two denominators. So these two p's are products of two principal values. And then you decompose. And you will find objects like this, which is one principal value times one delta. There are six of them, various combinations. And then constant times two deltas. And there are six other combinations. So these are objects that will contain one delta function, and these contain two delta functions. And the same for all the cut diagrams. Cut diagrams in the triangle are like this. And then you have two regions, depending on whether you consider T or T dagger on one side. You put T or T dagger on one side or the other side. So you have various um, cut diagrams. And in total, there are six after taking into account of the permutations. And then again, you will see that you can build this table where every row vanishes independently, every row. So you split the optical theorem into a purely algebraic uh, set of purely algebraic identities, which is uh, much more convenient and more practical. And uh, what if you want to say that one particle, one internal particle is a fake? For example, uh, leg number one. Well, if le leg number one is a fake, then you have to eliminate all the deltas that carry an index, an index one. Let me remind you that the delta AB has two frequencies, omega E and omega B. So, if you have delta 1, 2, inside you have a fake on frequency omega 1. So eliminate the entire row. And then the entire row here, and this one, and this one, and all those, because they all contain something like that. And then once you have done that, you will see that some columns will disappear automatically because they contain only zeros in blue, which are these ones. And what uh, are those that disappear? They are those that where the leg one, leg number one, is cut and one is a phacon, so the cut propagator of the phacon is zero. And that's why the column disappear completely 
and then you have a reduced table and that will be the table for the triangle with one fake internal leg. And then you can, uh, in this uh, paper where I uh, formulated these identities for the optical theorem and then the fake on prescription in this diagrammatic sense, you can find also boxes, pentagons, hexagons, bo uh, boxes with diagonal and, and the proof to all order. And then coming back to what we were, we were discussing before, remember that the FACOM projection, which, which is this elimination of uh, degrees of freedom and delta functions, basically, has to be performed also on the classical action because the classical action will not be the one you start from because the one we start, you start from will contain a propagating degree of freedom instead of the FACOM. And uh, that means that you have to um, integrate out, basically, the phacon field, even at the classical level, with its own green function, with no boundary conditions, and the green function is the principal value, as I stress, in the classical limit. So it will uh, be a, an effective micro non-local and micro acausal interaction among the physical particles the other particles. That's uh, the meaning of it. And how does this micro non-locality and micro acausality extend? How, how does it extend? For example, uh, it is dependent on the mass of these objects. The scale is the reciprocal of the mass. So since these objects are assumed to be good for quantum gravity, let's say that you have the mass equal to 10 to the 12, 13 GV from cosmology, then the time of violation of microcausality is something like 10 to the minus 36 seconds, which is a time that doesn't exist in our instruments, because I remind you that we at most can measure 10 to the minus 17 seconds with laser pulses. So this is one billion times one billion times below that. But you could have also lighter phacons and in phenomenology that's what we are exploring. And then, then you, it's, uh, it's uh, a question. What is this implication on uh, micro, uh, on causality and so on, so forth. So again, uh, Think of uh, a gauge fixed action. You have uh, ghosts, Fadeh Popov ghosts, and longitudinal and temporal uh, components of your gauge fields, and you have a classical gauge fixed action. Of course, you don't consider that a, the classical action. That's not the classical action. You first have to eliminate the redundant degree of freedom. And here you have to do the same, but with different rules, because the projection is consistent, not because of the gauge symmetry, but because of this diagrammatics. But you have to do it. So, for example, if you take uh, quantum gravity, what would the theory would be? Well, you start from this classical action, but this will not be the classical action. But you start from that because you want to have local FIMA rules, precisely as you start from a gauge fixed action with ghosts, for the pop of ghosts, etc. That's a very powerful simplification because it allows you to use local rules. And you start with that, you apply all the rules, and you will propagate three fields. One is the graviton, the other one, the scalar is uh, the inflaton, so its mass will be 10 to the 13 GeV. And then the third one, the spin 2 with mass m, which has a kinetic term with the wrong sign, you will have to quantize it this way. So basically, even at the classical level, this is not the true classical action, it will be, the classical action is what? It is the collection of the three diagrams, where you have these two particles in the external legs, but those only in the internal legs. And so they will build effective interactions among non-local, micro non-local, among the others. And by the way, with uh, Bianchi and Piva in the paper on cosmology, we found a bound that says that the mass of, from cosmology, the mass of the spin two must be bigger than one-fourth the mass of phi, so if the mass of phi is around 10 to the 13 GeV, the mass of chi will be 
that or larger than that. So necessarily, this micro causality violation will happen below 10 to the minus 36 seconds, which can be important in cosmology indeed. That's where these kind of times can be important. So let's uh, now come to higher spin uh, massive multiplets and what we can do with them. Because higher spin uh, multiplets are, are a way to um, have uh, uh, what you normally have with higher derivative. But we uh, excuse, me, excuse me, let me interrupt you before we go to higher spins. Yes. Let's go to the square, square gravity. Formally, you can uh, find the propagators uh, on, the, on the base of action. There will be propagators for graviton, phantom, and phacion. Yes. There will be propagators for massive spin, uh, massive spin two. Then, from your point of view, understand, we change the form of propagators. We preserve the, prop the standard propagators for graviton and phantom, but uh, change the propagator for spin two massive particles. Is it true? Yes, we, you change the propagator and the whole and diagram. Then make calculations. Then make calculations. And all the diagrammatics, because otherwise, if you just change the propagator inside Feynman diagrams, the optical yeah. theorem will be violated, because uh, um, it uh, loops talk talk with trees in uh, in that identity. Yes. Mm. So you have to do everything consistent to arbitrarily high orders. Yes. Okay, but uh, sometimes we calculate another way. We use so-called so the schwinger delete technique, which allows to calculate everything in generally uh, covariant form. Yes. So, for example, in one loop, we consider some uh, differential operator corresponding yes. to second derivative of action and, co and consider trace logarithm of this operator. But in this approach, we don't see difference between the graviton and phantom and phacion. Um, or maybe there is. Uh, so, uh, the point is that you do not see difference between a f fake and a non-fake uh, as long as you are in the Euclidean or below every threshold. But as soon as you rotate, the Vic rotation will have to be made differently to accommodate these rules. It will be not analytic. And every, every time you cross a physical threshold which, where you would produce these particles because they would become real, then the amplitude changes. And so that's not trivial. It's not trivial to put these theories on the lattice. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's not trivial. The renormalization, for example, of the theory is entirely the same as usual. So the renormalization of the theory is the same because the renormalization is, lives in the Euclidean, basically. It doesn't know anything about thresholds. It's a local thing itself. But once you go to Minkowski, you have to do it uh, in, uh, in a proper way. And that's the crucial thing that changes the physical content of this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, just a comment. <clears throat> so, in principle, uh, having different prescription for ghosts and uh, physical graviton uh, could be consistent with general covariance. You can write quadratic action in some first order form using some auxiliary. Yes, yes, so, we have done that in. Uh, yeah. You can separate uh, all of them, yeah. Yes, so you, in principle, it need not be inconsistent with covariance. I mean, these different prescriptions. No, no, it's not. It's uh, consistent. This I cannot prove here, but it's consistent with gauge invariance also. Simply because gauge invariance can also be expressed in, in the table. Uh, every, um, um, every threshold doesn't speak with the other thresholds. So every line here is either gauge dependent everywhere in all diagrams, so it disappears it behaves the same way in all diagrams, or it is gauge invariant in all diagrams uh, of the cut uh, of the cutting equation. Uh, <clears throat> but again, uh, <laughs> sorry to raising this again. So the, the, there was an objection to Liebig in some paper, which I have a reference actually. Um, it related indeed to vacuum instability because if you have what they say, the ghosts are uh, uh, with their prescription are decaying. Yes. And once you include interactions with ordinary matter, uh, the, uh, the instability in the vacuum appears. And then one needs to estimate what's the, what's the time compared to time of the universe. So this instability of the vacuum is an issue. Uh, so trying to, re trying to solve this unitarity problem, you run into this instability. So I think it's also important in principle, maybe important here. So well, it's one thing is, yeah. Uh, one has to uh, consider this uh, issue uh, from 
scratch because here you don't have any decay of these things. So these things are eliminated by this diagrammatics and instead in uh, Levick models you, they are eliminated not by the by these rules but because they have a width and uh, you need to wait till they decay basically to have a sort of reduced uh, S matrix that can be unitary. And um, so the approaches are completely different and this has to be, uh, I've, I've not done that, yes. But, uh, Damian, just a naive question. Uh, so if I have a theory, normal action and so on, is it for me to decide which of uh, the normal particles to make into vacuum so yes. I can... It, it's uh, for you. So basically, you can what you what you can do is anytime you add some field, uh, well, if it, if it has in front of the kinetic term a minus sign, if it has the wrong sign, then it's not up to you. You have uh, necessarily to quantize it as a phacon, otherwise it is a ghost. But if it is a plus, if it is an ordinary particle, you are free to make it fake, and this is uh, your decision. But there is one caveat that you cannot make massless fields fake. So all massless fields will be physical necessarily because the violation of microcausality is 1 divided by the mass and so if the mass is 0 you violate causality not in a non-observable way but in a, in a presumably observable way or you have to work out other methods and um, massive uh, massless phacons also in diagrammatics can raise some questions about infrared divergences. So their masses should not be zero and, uh, uh, and they should not be tachyons. Okay, this is crucial now for higher spin models. They should not be tachyons. The real part uh, should be greater than zero. But you do not need a width. Yes, you do not need a, a, a here, you do not need to make them decay. This is crucial. But what happens if I play this game with the usual models? Take some electroweak model and then suddenly make, I don't know, Z boson fake and what happens? Or something like this? Yes, yes. So this is uh, uh, something we are also trying to check. So uh, if uh, since the diagrams change, for example, the value of the bubble change, and uh, in many, uh, the value ch does change because those two things that you eliminate contribute then uh, um, you will see changes in every plot. For example, the Z peak plot will change the value quantitatively because it is important to calculate loop corrections for those. And we are working them out under the various hypotheses. I can exclude that Z boson and W boson are fake, but uh, Higgs, Higgs is still a question. Higgs would need more data basically because um, but the, since the um, loop corrections um, are important for every um, prediction at CERN and the loop diagrams change here, they may change a little bit and the, the corrections might be difficult to detect, but at some point they will be detectable. The other way is to try and look for the particle itself because you cannot find a, a fake. It doesn't exist in the asymptotic states, but you know that we do not check for the Z bosons in the asymptotic states. We just determine the existence of the Z bosons from their decay products because they leave too shortly. And uh, the same for Ws and the same for Higgs. So in those cases, we, we cannot directly see much of a difference. But if you go to any plot that receives crucial contributions from loop corrections, and, and these do, uh, uh, not close to the peak maybe of the Z, but maybe a little higher because you have to cross other thresholds, then you will see a difference. And at some point, if we make experiments that are precise enough, that difference will be uh, detectable. Now we are estimating the difference. It seems that it is a little bit small for, for today, uh, for the accelerators that have been um, uh, built in the past, but uh, but it is there. Okay, many thanks. Mm. Uh, sorry, I wanted to ask something. Maybe it's the same that Arkady asked. So I wonder at la at classical level, we usually have a Stragratsky instabilities related to ghosts, right? If you have higher derivative terms, so does it actually cure it this prescription? Um, 
This I don't know because uh, again, this is a problem that has to be uh, considered from uh, anew, and uh, this is not the classical action. Let me stress it again. So, if you if you were uh, if this were the classical action, then you would have the same conclusions. But this is not. So you have to think of this action. You build all the uh, three diagrams of it, and then you um, integrate out. Uh, you consider only the three diagrams with physical fields in the external legs, graviton or inflaton, but no phacon. And then you build the classical action out of that. It is very complicated because it is non-local. And I, in a paper, I studied it, but it's, uh, it needs to be studied perturbatively, you know. Because remember, here we are in the, in the perturbative regime. This is uh, crucial. Yeah, yeah, I should uh, stress it very clearly. Because one thing, for example, that the Levick models cannot do is a purely perturbative approach. Precisely because you need objects to decay, their width has to be resumed. And then you have a mixture of a perturbative and non, uh, uh, some resummation approach. But here, the, the diagrammatics is perturbative. And even in the classical limit, I can, you have remnants of the quantum origin of these objects. So even in the classical limit, I can tell you that if I try and eliminate this, and then I build the classical action, it will turn out to be an asymptotic expansion most of the times. And uh, around any background, even the, the simple uh, oscillator with a, with a phi to the four correction, you can check in my papers, it will be an asymptotic action. So I don't really have an exact classical action to play with and answer these kind of problems of, uh, at this stage, actually. But they, they, they are interesting, and I understand that this is something that has to be done, because in some cases, you can cross these obstacles, for example, in cosmology where you have a non-trivial um, background. And at the beginning, we thought it was beyond what we do normally in uh, uh, particle physics, because there you just have a flat space. And instead, many things can be said. But uh, I cannot just uh, jump right away to a conclusion because of these reasons. Normally, the, the projected classical action, which will be the true classical action, which will be an asymptotic expansion. So. Only the non-perturbative theory of gravity, quantum gravity, and phacons would be able to give me the non, the exact classical limit. That's why you you have to be a little bit cautious here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about uh, path integrals? So one often derives uh, I have some prescription from well, it comes from time ordering, which in turn follows from path integral. Uh, yes. So. Uh, yeah, in a way, it justifies it. In, so yes, can you change no, it? Then? No, this is a uh, path integral here is seen as a bookkeeping for the diagrammatics. So basically, uh, you have uh, diagrams. You build everything out of diagrams, which is done as the way I told you, which can be uh, related to a path integral for a bookkeeping. But the only thing that you ha need to prove in the, in the whole... Uh, the whole uh, identity that you need here to prove is that the integral of a total derivative is zero. And everything then follows. And this is a diagrammatic identity that you can prove without really a path integral, but you can justify with a path integral. But once you have that, then you have word identities, then you have the optical theorem and everything. Uh, so yes, you, you need uh, these uh, rules uh, here with Levick also, uh, if you want to do the diagrammatics, and, um, and le let's, say, let's say that here in this approach, uh, physics is diagrammatics uh, purely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, what is uh, that you can do uh, with higher spin multiplets? Let me show you briefly with a vector. If you write down the most general action with two derivatives uh, for a vector. This is what you get. A mass term and two terms here. If a1 is minus 1, then you have proca, but we do not wa want proca. Let me uh, work out the propagator of this with a1, so it's arbitrary so far. 
The propagator can be written in two forms. This one, which is the unitary form, and this one, which is the renormalizable form. They are equivalent, they are the same. But here you see the renormalizability, because you see you have 1 over p squared, and then in the coefficients you have only objects that behave like p, p divided by p squared. So in the ultraviolet they behave nicely. So this goes like 1 over p squared. But here instead you see unitarity, because you are really the, uh, separating the proca part and the scalar. But you have p, p divided by m squared, and so you do not see that the theory, the underlying theory is actually, is actually normalizable. And uh, you also would conclude that the theory is not unitary, because the proca part has the right sign. If I choose the right sign here, I could change it, but, but the scalar part does not have the right sign. So if, uh, if you study this theory, you would propagate a proca vector and a ghost. But if you quantize this as a fake, then the problem uh, of unitarity disappears. By the way, the two masses are related to this, uh, through this parameter. You have to fulfill the ta no tachyo condition, as I said, because, because all the diagrammatics I told you about fake particles do not work with uh, tachyons. And, uh, and that you can do for every, every higher spin uh, field, which will be a traceless and completely symmetric uh, tensor, uh, traceless and completely symmetric tensor, like chi mu nu, for example, with spin 2. We take it traceless to make the thing, the multiplet irreducible, but it is not just spin 2, it is spin 2, spin 1, and spin 0. Sorry, could, could you go back to the spin 1 case before you go to the spin 2? Sorry, is it okay? Thanks. Um, I thought it's, it should be dependent on the value of A1, what happens with, uh, with a ghost or not. But apparently you said just because of the form of propagator, regardless of the exact value, the precise value of A1, there can be a ghost because of the sign of the second term in the first form of the propagator. Yes, here, here you always have the same sign. It doesn't depend on, M1, oh, on A1 because this is square. Mm. Um, Oh, uh, no, because I'm assuming that this is square. Mm -hmm. No, if you want, if you write, you use this identity here, you write mm -hmm. M1 as M0 times this, then written in that form, it depends on A1. Yeah. Probably yeah. this is what you are referring to. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, by assuming... So, first of all, you have to require that these are positive. All the mm -hmm. masses are positive, no tachyon condition. But mm -hmm. then it will imply that this is necessarily uh, a ghost. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, more or less the same happens in uh, fields with more indices. For example, in spin 2, you can always still write the propagator as a, in a normalizable form, where the behavior is 1 over p squared because you have projectors that involve only p's divided by p's. But you can have p's divided by masses to see the unitary decomposition, and then you will have a spin 2 pole, a spin 1 with the wrong sign, again, once you fulfill the notachium condition, it will always be the wrong sign, and the spin 0, which will always have the plus sign, and they are alternating. So in the middle here, you have to use the fake on prescription for this otherwise. So basically, you have only a spin 2 and a spin 0 propagating because this one will be integrated out and it will be an effective micro, non-local and micro a causal interaction among the others. And you can add interaction, we will see in a moment. Before that, let me briefly sketch what happens with spin s. The same thing, they are in the uh, Lagrangian, you only have three terms. The propagator is the, can be written in the two forms, the renormalizable one and the... And, um, unitary one, and you have an otakian condition, a relation among the masses in the multiplet, and uh, they are alternating uh, physical, fake, physical, fake, physical, fake, spin s, s minus one, s minus two, and so on and so forth. And for fermions, it's more or less the same. Fermions are described by a spinner with uh, symmetric and traceless indices, and in addition, you ask that it satisfies that, that condition. 
the here the the formulas are a little bit simpler actually but the propagators are very very complicated or you can take uh, anti-symmetric tensors uh, or you can take symmetric non-traceless tensors these are non these things are non irreducible so they are basically compositions of the things we you had before these are now, um, they obey power counting now, so you can add interactions, like phi to the fourth, if you take, for example, a spin two. So this L2 is the one we saw before, which is made of the sum of three terms, traceless and symmetric tensor. And you add some phi to the four interactions and then you can uh, work out the, the bubble diagram the one loop renormalization and you can check for example that the unitarity theorem holds with um, the fake prescription for the spin one in between and so on there are other things that are interesting uh, because you may remember that in gauge uh, Yamis fields you can have a Veneziano limit, so called, which is the large NC and large NF. NC is the number of colors and NF is the number of fermions with uh, a ratio that tends to some specific prescribed value, and then you can build some interacting weakly coupled fixed points in some cases for zeros of the beta functions that are um, called bank sucks fixed points and that you can do also with higher spins coupled to gauge fields uh, but the most interesting thing is that you can change the ultraviolet behavior of gravity as shown by piva later so let me um let me see if i now this is postponed so i will talk about that later and uh, now i will tell you about another application of this which is palatini quantum gravity and later we will see how you can use um, these um, higher spin multiplets to change the ultraviolet behavior of this theory so this theory has a ultraviolet behavior which doesn't depend on the prescription fake or not because the renormalization is local and um, euclidean if you want and it is the same uh, but may I remember that if you choose these coefficients in order to have no tachyons, so I already call them masses, squared masses, then this theory is not asymptotically free. Not sure you need asymptotic freedom, but if you want asymptotic freedom, it's possible by adding massive multiplets. Another thing that you can do by adding a massive multiplet is Palatini gravity because that is just this theory plus a spin 3 multiplet. It's a huge spin 3 multiplet actually because it contains everything. But basically in Palatini you are treating the metric and the um, connection as independent fields. And uh, that's uh, equivalent if you shift uh, the connection by means of the Levi Civita one and you introduce a certain independent uh, spin 3 tensor then this action is exactly equal to the usual Hilbert action plus a mass term for this which you can call Palatini multiplet so basically if you really want uh, a Palatini theory that would be an effective low energy limit of some propagating spin 3 massive multiplet but now you know how to build its action and how to formulate it in a unitary way you need to give kinetic terms to these and possibly interactions and even you have to enlarge the set of the mass terms because this is not the most general quadratic thing that you can construct so the palatini multiplet is huge because we are not assuming anything here we are not assuming vanishing torsion we are not uh, assuming metricity and uh, then you have uh, everything basically you have a spin three uh, five spin twos nine vectors and five scalars and uh, inside that there is a torsion submultiplet which vanishes when the torsion vanishes and then there is a metric 
incompatibility multiplet which vanishes when the metric is uh, um, compatible. Okay, and then the action, the action for this multiple is very complicated, but in the free field limit, it's uh, basically the same as we saw before. This is an anti-symmetric uh, spin three sub multiplet inside the huge multiplet, and these are its no tachyon conditions. But anyway, the philosophy is the same as before, and you. Just to show you that uh, how the th uh, complete theory looks like. Um, so it's, I repeat, conceptually it is very simple because it is just the previous theory of gravity plus a massive multiplet, which might exist or not in nature, might be reduced by some conditions like the torsion condition or not, who knows. But in the end, it is just a matter multiplet with all the massive, the mass terms and all the kinetic terms and possibly many, many non-minimal terms, even phi to the fourth interactions are allowed, and that will still be renormalizable and unitary if you quantize the parts, uh, the um, fields with negative signs in uh, the kinetic terms as fake particles. It's me. Yes. What dictates the choice of the kinetic terms for, um, for these multiplets? Oh, yeah, this is just the most general one because I have uh, to build a renormalizable theory, and so the only thing is uh, that uh, it can it has to be uh, the most general one, and the only thing that you cannot choose is the relative signs of the um, kinetic uh, terms of the fields inside the same irreducible multiplet, and so uh, once you decide the overall sign of a multiplet, for example, here this is a submultiplet. An irreducible submultiple. Once you decide the overall sign, you will have a tower with uh, um, various pings with uh, given signs, and you can decide which ones are fake and which ones are physical. Okay, and some free parameters you can absorb in redefinition of some of the. There are, yes. So, Damian, excuse me, we're running a bit late, but there yes, were many it's, questions. Uh, it's so the what? end. It, 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 just a uh, very f uh, last uh, mm -hmm. transparency. I want to tell you that in uh, the gravity theory with no Palatini multiplet, you do not have asymptotic freedom. You have two couplings, one for the vi squared terms and one for the r squared terms, which are the two masses of the two particles, basically, or two fine structure constants, if you want. But the beta function doesn't have a zero. But uh, Piva showed in a recent paper that if you add some spin three irreducible multiplet, which could also be a subset of the Palatini one, maybe, then you can. You can change the ultraviolet behavior. And so this can lead to further developments. So conclusions, uh, purely virtual particles are based on a new diagrammatics and which have many applications from phenomenology to cosmology. And uh, I, give some uh, I want to stress again this prediction because normally you can not uh, you do not think that quantum gravity may be uh, testable in, in our in our lifetime but uh, if it has uh, unique and very sharp consequences on primordial cosmology then it can probably and um, and one application that we described at length here is to give sense to higher spin fields, massive fields, but within certain multiples because of renormalizability and unitarity can be cured um, in this way. And uh, it is also possible to uh, formulate a Palatini version of quantum gravity and it's also possible to change the uh, ultraviolet behavior of the renormalization group flow of, of quantum gravity. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Damiana, for an excellent talk. And uh, are there any uh, questions? Immediately. Uh, so I, I would like, uh, well, you can raise hands just oh. so that we don't. Ah, okay, Ivano. Oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I see, I, I thought Nicola had a question, but actually he was clapping. But anyway, uh, hi, Damian, again. Thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, so I had a couple of questions, uh, if there's time, Eugenia. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, the first one is, uh, so you, you talked about massive higher spins. 
Um, and and if, if I understand correctly, you know, you, you can build interactions, everything is consistent, etc. But what about massless higher spins? What have, maybe you mentioned it, I missed it. Yeah, uh, no, I cannot uh, say much about that because uh, if you uh, extend what is uh, the situation here, you will see that um, um, in uh, massless cases, uh, well, nothing uh, of this will work, basically. And uh, in, uh, in addition, you would have... Uh, <coughs> Possibly to have some massless fake particles, which are physically problematic because of the violations of causality yeah, at of uh, arbitrary scales. But aside from that, I want maybe I cannot find it right away, but I do not think that this will uh, work. And not even these formulas, I think, will make sense for this one, will probably. But uh, this other one, no, I don't think. I see. Interesting. You you know that uh, massless higher spin fields uh, have a lot of problems. I think you, if you take the limit, you will find them all described in yeah, a that, different way. That, that's why I was wondering if uh, this could circumvent, you know, uh, the, the problems. Um, and and then I I was thinking. <clears throat> What about um, fermions? Like, if you were to adapt this this uh, prescription to fermions, what would something change in uh, ABJ anomalies and uh, index theorems and and the like? Uh, so no, because um, the, the the entire normalization part and the anomaly part is the same. The mm. that is uh, below threshold, if you want. That is. Also yeah, in, the, in the Euclidean, yeah. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Mita, uh, or yeah, was somebody raised hand from IITMP? Uh, it's Maxim. Hi. Ah, Maxim. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it calls his name <laughs> Skype. Uh, just, just, just to clarify a little bit, when you were talking about massive fields. Mm -hmm. You use Lagrangians, which contains Gauss, not the Fields Paulo, Sinhagen. Are you was your statement that uh, using this fake technology you can eliminate you, you can call these modes uh, fake ions and uh, get a consistent quantization unit? Yes, is it correct? you have uh, that's uh, that's it. So you have uh, uh, the possibility to uh, uh, quantize these objects in uh, in this way. Both if they are ghosts, if they have the wrong sign, and then they will not be ghosts, they will be this thing. But also if they are physical particles, also if they have the right sign. So that's um, a new diagrammatics. But you have to do it, it consistently inside diagrams, as I said, because otherwise the optical theorem will not be uh, correct. So basically the crucial point is that you in this uh, identity, or let me, let me go here, if you have, for example, a, an identity with, uh, uh, if you have ghosts in your theory, then you will have some minus signs for some ends here in this. This uh, identity will be called pseudo-unitary. Then you can say, okay, I, I want to ignore from in and out states all the ghosts, as we do with Fadeh Popov, by the way. We, I ignore them. This is free you can do always ignore anything you want from in and out but you cannot ignore what appears inside so your ghost will appear back that's what why you have to change the diagrammatics completely to make the thing consistent and so then they are not ghosts they are this new thing but that also changes the classical limit and that has remnants in the classical limit in the sense that you have to project also the classical lagrangian and so on and so forth so you Thank you. It's really a and, classicization uh, of a quantum theory, and even in the classical limit of gra gravity, you will have uh, an asymptotic expansion just at h bar equal zero. Thank you. And uh, sec second part, uh, can you rephrase your prescription in terms of observables? Like, for instance, when we do uh, Fadeev Popov quantization, we not only we ask for uh, no ghosts in external states, but we also restrict uh, the class of observables. We, we ask for BRST invariant observables to, to, to average and pass integral. 
So what you are doing somehow is similar to, to this. You are not computing anything. Not uh, You are not computing any observable. You are only concentrating on special observables, but then there should be symmetry behind. Sorry for slightly, it's very vague, of course. Yes, so uh, this uh, I concentrated so far on the S matrix and the scattering processes. I am asking about um, correlation functions of uh, observables. Like uh, normally you say you, you, you restrict observables to gauge invariant observables. And what would the, be the restriction here? I think the restriction here is that the observables should be projected. Normally, this is uh, what you do. Namely, it's like uh, saying that in the classical limit, you have uh, no the not the classical Lagrangian you start from, but some projection of it. So basically, the the observables should be built only with this. Only the, with the physical physics. You cannot, basically, you do not have creation and operation and, and uh, annihilation operators for those. You just have to, you can build an observable, a non local or, or local observable as you normally do, but only with those two fields. And if, if to write it down, you need the third one, then you have to project it inside the observable. And that will be, will turn very easily a local observable into uh, a non local one. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Denis Comelli, if I'm uh, ah. yes, no, please. Damiano, uh, yes. in, a, in a some sense, you are solving in another way the cutting equation, yes, hmm? which is a unitary problem. Do you think there are other solutions or uh, the problem is closed? That means. Uh, free solution, the classical one, let's say, the Feynman prescription. Ah, the, if there are other possibilities. Fakeons so. and uh, the, Lee, the, Lee, the prescription. Mm, do you think it's closed the problem or, or there are... Uh... Uh, I think it is, uh, yeah, I think, I think these are the only possibilities because yeah. they amount to plus one, minus one and zero. Yes. Plus yeah. one is a physical mm -hmm. particle, minus one is a yeah. weak, and zero is a fake. Okay, thanks. You can have superpositions of them, of course. Yeah, yeah, you can mix. Mix, yes. Uh, Nicola, you want to ask? Sorry if it's a bit reductive, but I'm trying to understand your approach, but is it true to say that you can make any theory renormalizable and unitary? Uh, no. Yet, yet, no? Sorry? No, uh, first the uh, renormalizability is the uh, is the um, the one uh, by you mean by adding things? Yeah, by choosing your rules, by deciding to make uh, one field or another fake, then you can cure unitarity. You can always solve the optical theorem. You, you can well, it, it, they have to be massive and they have not to be tachyons. Though, so for example, if here you put a plus, which is the theory that is asymptotically free, then you cannot do anything. Yes. Just changing so, a sign will make this huge difference, both in the randomization group role and in the quantization, because I cannot use any mm -hmm. other thing. But so, yes. Yeah, please. Okay. But by rejecting tachyon and uh, massless fields, then is it correct to say that you can make anything unitary? Yes. But then, is it at the expense of locality? With the ex yes, it's uh, at the expense of uh, micro-locality and, and micro-causality. Because you see this thing. This is the sum of advanced and, uh, and uh, retarded potential. So inside here, there is a, an advanced, an advanced uh, uh, potential. And that means that you will have with the masses that we expect from quantum gravity a, a prediction for example if you if you you can go back and forth forward in time but only within 10 to the minus 36 seconds so you have a very tiny violation of those things yes mm. yeah. sorry and, and also locality i mean it's... and so locality yes 
within the same range. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, I don't see any raised hands, so let me stop the official part. So I, uh, in particular, I stop uh, recording. Uh, recording but, stopped. Yes, but uh, I mean, the people are free to ask any other questions in the informal uh, part. So actually, I have. Uh, well, I would like to come back to this Z boson issue. So, uh, so basically, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that okay, we don't observe uh, Z and uh, many other particles. As actual particles, we observe them well after they uh, decayed into something. So, so, so basically, if you make Z into Fakian, then it will affect this plot you drew, but uh, the, the, the correction will be so small at the moment that we can't observe it, right? Uh, so, but maybe later, with uh, well, may, maybe even LHC can do that just by accumulating more data. But in principle, it does lead to noticeable uh, yes. difference. Yes. Okay. And, and uh, they are they are too small for the present experiments, but they are not very small. They, they, um, the point is that the correction is the in the imaginary part, and so even if it is uh, of the same order as the real part. Since what we observe is a, <laughs> a real thing, it's a modulus squared, it happens that basically the correction, the one loop correction, which has the same magnitude as uh, typical one loop diagrams, well, in the end, it will contribute only squared. And so um, basically it is uh, an unfortunate uh, thing because it's uh, smaller than uh, naively you would say. And, um, but it is there. So we are looking for uh, enhancements, the processes where this uh, correction is uh, slightly bigger, otherwise we have to wait a little bit. And since experiments are not uh, going on, uh, that could take a lot, just because yeah, of yeah, But, uh, uh, ah, sorry, Karapet, yes, please. I, uh, so one question that's a bit uh, on the side, uh, there was uh, another approach which can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear yeah. me? The quality could be better, but yes. Okay. Uh, there is another approach which suggests that uh, higher derivative uh, gravity or any other theory could be quantized somehow in a way that uh, you don't have cost. Uh, somehow a suggestion was that uh, uh, the, the problem usually with the cost is that there is energy is not bounded from pillow uh, because we have negative energy particles cost. Then uh, you can somehow take another quantity that is bounded from pillow and declare that your energy. Uh, so basically there is some different scheme. But uh, the, the problem of that scheme is that whenever you try to avoid the cost problem, then you lose also the property of this higher derivative theories of being renormalizable. So uh, I was just wondering if there is any connection uh, in this setup, whether... Mm -hmm. uh, who, who are the authors of this approach you're talking about? Uh, uh, so, Ljachovic, uh, Simon Ljachovic and uh, collaborators. So, uh, ah. they, they say, you say that uh, their theory is not renormalizable? So, what I remember is that their claim is that in higher derivative theories, you can find a quantization that avoids cost, but then you lose the uh, good properties of higher derivative theories that is renormalized. Ah, okay. So, in this case, uh, apparently I can do that. So, uh, probably I'm evading some of the assumptions they are making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Also, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't remember they actually quantize gravity. They, they, they point out that in um, high derivative theories where energy is usually unbounded, one might look for another observables that are actually bounded. But um, I think there is a long way from this to, I mean, actual quantization of gravity. So I don't, yeah. So I, I'm not sure they actually tried to do that, but they have some interesting models uh, to play with. So I have um, 
uh, where was I? Yes, but uh, um, so coming back to this Z boson, but uh, you, as you said, you have this violation of causality and locality, but now the the the, the scale is not a Planck scale; it's a Z boson mass scale. So. I mean, it should lead to some noticeable things. I don't know, like uh, like this computer disappearing immediately into space. Or, yes, no? that's that's one possibility uh, to to check to to uh, to check the thing by means of that. Of course, uh, still, even if the mass is uh, uh, below the Planck scale, it's uh, I, as far as I remember. Uh, what is it? Uh, the time that is. Uh, uh, so the, it's 91 GeV and compared to 10 to the 12 GeV. Uh, so this is 10 orders of magnitude. So instead of 10 to the minus 36 seconds, you would have 10 to the minus 26. But this is still much, much below any idea of time we have. I, I recall that we do not know whether time exists below this. Okay. And this is a record established by means of laser pulses. You cannot build many clocks with that. And, uh, and remember that also Einstein, when he, he did his uh, special relativity, he was always, always careful to say what is a clock, what is time, what is... So strictly speaking, whenever we talk time about, about time but below these scales, we are not really uh, talking about time. We're talking about some things that has to be but but even that's why we're doing phenomenology here now because even 100 GV is well below anything we can observe and then you can you can ask oh but, but I can boost these particles yes you can boost uh, the way you like but even if you reach the highest speeds that exist in the universe you will still see that it is too small to be detected and um, but in principle if you find a way and that's a possibility indeed uh, to to overcome the, the limitations I've just uh, told you. That that is a way to discriminate between the two possibilities. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. And uh, do you understand correctly that uh, so when uh, so pe so people spend some time trying to write these actions, as Maxim said, for massive fields, the Sinkagen or also Zinoyev approach to that. But uh, what you do instead, you 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 take just I mean rank as tensor, maybe traceless, maybe not, uh, but it looks like it's irrelevant. Then uh, you basically write. Uh, the most general quadratic part, yeah, and you can even have free coefficients which might affect some of the signs. But uh, whatever you write, if it's not tachyonic or, or, or massless, you make wrong thing, well, wrong particles into vacuons. And but the renormalizability is uh, is as usual. So I mean, there are usual restrictions on number of derivatives. Uh, okay, but uh, but it somehow leads to 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 too many free parameters, right? So because uh, the space of uh, of uh, things you can write increases dramatically. Yes, uh, because you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in quantum field theory, we have no um, restriction for matter fields, and uh, we have uh, uh, gauge principles to restrict the form of interactions and the actions of gravity and uh, Young Mills fields. But then, if you ask uh, what is the matter content of the standard model or the, the theory of the universe, you can always add an arbitrary number of massive fields as long as they are heavy and compatible with data. Unification uh, attempts have been uh, not very successful. And so, yes, in quantum field theory, basically you can add uh, a huge number of things, infinitely many in the matter sector. We are doubling them basically, because each of them can be also fake. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just, just to confirm, it, so at the level of diagrams, which is perturbation theory, you have this recipe, but what it means non-perturbatively, you don't know, right? Yes, so, yeah. uh, yes, exactly. So this is uh, an open problem and um, um, some hint came from cosmology because uh, in cosmology, once you study uh, the non, uh, non trivial background, you run into new things. And for example, you find this bound, 
which is non-perturbative from the point of view of quantum field theory. You would never be able to find an inequality like that by means of diagrams. But they are just because you put it in the non-trivial background and you have to make the thing consistent at high energies and low energies, you can find some sort of non-perturbative information which could be useful. Well, that's all. And that's a completely open uh, territory. Of course, yeah. it's open in uh, physical particles as well because you don't know much about uh, non-perturbative quantum field.